see you here today. This message that God's laid on my heart, it's probably going to be something for the record books for the longest title I've ever preached. Sister Myers thought I was going to say the longest message I ever preached. Her mouth already was dropping down. She was nervous. <laughs> I don't think it'll be that. But last night, I began to work on this again, and the way the Lord gave it to me is the way that I, I put it down. And I'd rather obey God than worry what other people may think. But it's definitely a long title. It's not a chapter, but it's probably getting real close. If you will, turn your Bibles this morning to Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse 17 through verse 20. And when you have it, if you'll stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of God. I don't know about you, but this morning I have felt the presence of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nehemiah chapter number 2, verses 17 through verse number 20. If you have it, say praise the Lord. Bible said, then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and he also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing? That you do. Will you rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Two things I want you to notice before we go to preaching this morning. And Nehemiah has challenged the people to build. Let us rise up and build. They strengthened their hands to get ready to go build. The enemy came against them. And in verse 20, he said, Then I answered them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. I'd like to see some people in the house of God get that kind of attitude, that kind of mindset and thinking. God said we can rise up and build, so that's what we're going to do. With the help of the Lord this morning, I'd like to preach for a while on just one Nehemiah can move a crowd, and just one crowd can re rebuild an entire city. Amen. For those of you that didn't get that, I'm going to read it again. Just one Nehemiah can move a crowd, and just one crowd can rebuild an entire city. Stretch your hand of the Lord this morning. Let's pray for the will of God. God, this morning we appreciate your good word, your spirit. We pray, God, this morning that you'll help us to get a hold of your goodness and your help in Jesus' mighty name. I'm asking you this morning, Lord, to touch the church. God, that you'll speak to every one of us. We need your spirit in this house. And you're anointing that makes the difference. And we'll give you glory for everything you do. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them, let's rise up and build this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hopefully you don't mind me taking my time this morning. I don't want to rush too quickly. But I want to tell you a little bit about this story, Nehemiah's day. Hopefully you'll be able to see how it applies to us. All these details leading up to what the Lord has led us to. God's people had been held in a captivity, Babylonian captivity for some time. Some are believing that this is about the second wave, possibly, of people that are coming out or could come out of Babylonian captivity. Some believe there's one wave of people that have escaped or got out, but there was still a group left inside of this Babylonian place. At some point, we see reading back in chapter number one how that one of Nehemiah's brethren, a man by the name of Hananiah, one and some of Hananiah and his friends came to Nehemiah and began to convey that those that were still in Babylonian captivity had not made it out and were in great time of affliction. Not only that, but their home place, Jerusalem, was in complete ruins. So when Nehemiah begins to get the word that things are not well, obviously, just like you, if you found out some of your, your uh, whether it's your in-laws or your outlaws, if it's your family, you find out they're in bad shape, that has a way of getting a hold of your heart. It has a way of disturbing you and grieving you. Now, I'm the type of person I don't like to see people struggle. If you're a child of God, I don't know why you'd feel any other way. But I don't like to see people struggle. And I believe that when we look at Nehemiah, he was the same way. I'm glad that God still had a man in his day that was concerned about more than just himself. I've met a lot of people over the years that had this idea, this mentality. We're saved. We got the victory. And if you get it, praise God. Come join us. Worship with us. But we're not going to go out of our way or do anything to help you get to where we are. I don't believe that's the will of God. I believe that true men and women of God care about those that are in distress and those himself there in the first place. It's important for you to understand that. You see, when we look at the text, we see that they're in Babylonian captivity. But except you go back and read historically, you wouldn't understand that it was their disobedience and their rebellion that caused God to lift his hand to allow them to get into this place of Babylonian captivity. The only way the devil can get to you, and Job could testify to this, is if God lifts his hand or lifts that veil and allows the enemy to come at you. If you're a child of God, the only way the devil can get at you is if God allows it. Otherwise, the devil does not have the ability to put a free-range target on your life and just wreak havoc. There are things that God allows to come in your life as a child of God that God knows that you will be stronger when it's all over with. He allows you to be tried. Your faith is tested. You will never know how faithful you are or how much you really love God until that love is tried. I see a lot of marriages and it seemed like while they've got cotton candy and roses and chocolate and nice love letters, everything is good. But as soon as that marriage is tried and they go through five financial hardship and this happens and that happens and everybody's against them, it's only then that you realize how real and true and genuine that the love is between those two people. If you see somebody that's good in the good times, everything
everything's great. But when adversity comes, one of them just takes off and leaves. I don't tell you this morning, as much as I hate to be the one to tell you this, that doesn't say a lot for a relationship. And I can tell you this, amen, these people in this day, they had failed their God and God allowed things to happen and they began to get in, in captivity, a Babylonian captivity. And so here we've got a people that are grieved, a people that are in distress, a people that are in bondage, and we've got a man of God who still loves God, still loves God's people, and he's got a message from his friends. Hannah and I and his buddies have come along and said they're in distress. Not only that, but the land of our forefathers, Jerusalem, the place where the sepulchers of our fathers are at, that place has laid ruin. The gates of the city have been burned. The wall of the city has been torn down. And I don't know, but in my mind, when I look at it, I think of a place that looks like that it was once an historic city, but it looks like somebody flew a fighter jet over top of it and blew it all apart. That's what I see in my mind. A place that was once a place of their people. A place that was once where they grew up and they served God. They loved God. They had places and houses of worship. They had businesses. They had farms. They had market streets and all of that. But all of that has been destroyed as a result of their their rebellion and as a result of their turning away from God. Now I told you it's important for us to understand why that they had got themselves in this place and it was their fault because sometimes we get it in our mind that God cannot possibly love me and God cannot possibly forgive me because I've done too much wrong. Amen. I've smoked too much drugs or I've drank too much alcohol. I've ran around with too many people. I've cut too many people off in the traffic. I don't know what your thing is or what you've done wrong, but I can tell you this, that that mindset, that thinking is a wrong kind of thinking. Obviously, because the same God that spoke to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 18 was the same God that dealt with Nehemiah's heart. That God that said, cannot I make this clay again another vessel? In other words, God was speaking to the people. I know that you messed up. I know you got your life jacked up in a lot of junk, but I'm here to tell you that I can put your messed up junk on the potter's wheel and I can make a I can make something of beauty out of you but you got to be willing to let the potter mold the clay how many knows that he is the great potter he was the potter before there ever was an earthly potter he was that supernatural potter and if anybody knows how to form the clay it would have to be the one that wrote the blueprint in the first place the one that breathed breath into some dirt and some spit and made a man come alive the one that took a rib out of a man's side and made a woman that same God I want to tell you this morning I'm glad to know that he's a God of mercy I'm glad to know that he's a God of love I'm glad to know that he still cares about my next door neighbor I'm glad that he didn't just get a bunch of us saved and said I'm done forget the rest of us I want you to know he still cares about the crack addict laying up underneath a bridge somewhere in downtown Orlando he still cares about the homeless prostitute who don't know any other way to make a living. He still, no, come on somebody, I'm glad to know this morning that he's still a God of peace and of love and of hope. And I want to tell you the Bible said if we had only hope in this life, we'd be of all men most miserable. I want to tell you an atheist don't have a lot of hope. If you say you think we came from a big bang or from some kind of explosion or that we evolved from some monkey. Let me tell you, friend, you better enjoy your life because there ain't a lot left of it. I want to tell you, 60, 70, 80 years of life, it does not last very long. But I'm glad to know this morning that all of eternity is before us. And when I draw my last breath, that I can wake up on the shores of heaven with a song in my heart and a dance in my feet and a glory to God because he kept me through the race. Can you say amen, somebody? There's going to be a lot of people that are disappointed when they realize that these preachers that have been preaching all these years were right. You wake up in eternity 
and you stand before the Bible said that God had an eyes, eyes like a flaming fire, feet like fine brass, a robe all the way to the foot. I'm telling you, I, that is a God that I wouldn't want to stand before. Amen. In a life of disobedience and rebellion to God, can you say amen, somebody? I'm telling us this morning, amen, that God can move on the heart of just one person and set great things in motion. Now, I'm going to testify just for a moment to you. But when I was younger, you most of you know, my life was an absolute spiritual and sinful train wreck. Amen. Up and down, in and out, all over the place. But because God moved on my heart and I gave my life to God, amen, my son is now playing the drums, knows how. And then to serve God, amen, married a wife who loves God, trying to serve the Lord together. I got a wife, amen, together we serve God. I've been pastor now for many years. We've seen a lot of people saved. We've seen a lot of great things happen in the ministry God has blessed us with. And it never would have happened if God wouldn't have just moved on the heart of one man to preach one message in 1997. And I gave my life to God on an altar in a little bitty church that didn't have but a handful of people in a little revival. Honey, you ain't got to have a great congregation. You ain't got to have some big thing going on. You ain't got to have a hundred piece choir. All you got to have is a hungry desire. And when it hits the anointing, the anointing and a hunger, it's going to bring about a revival and a change in your life that will take you in another direction. Amen. You might say, preacher, why do you preach the way you do? Why are you so fervent? I'll tell you, when you get a hold of what I got a hold of, it'll do the same thing in your life. I tell you, I used to sit on a pew and listen to that anointed preaching of the word of God. And I said, man, what in the world got a hold of him? I tell you what it is. It's the good God of heaven. And I want to tell you, folks are about up to here with dead churches and dead preacher with worship. Let me tell you, mighty Ray Cyrus can sing. Come on, somebody. I tell you, there are rock and roll singers that can sing. There are people that can speak well. But the anointing will make the difference. Can you say amen? My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. But Nehemiah, his heart's overwhelmed. He's a grieved man of God. And God's dealing with him to do something about this situation. Have you ever felt a burden for something and you wanted to do something but you didn't know what to do? I can only imagine that that might have been the place, Brother Billy, that, that Nehemiah was in. I want to do something. I want to get my people out of that land. I want to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But God, how am I supposed to do this? You see, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. Amen. The word of God reveals that to us. And he tells us that one day after he's heard of all this grievous stuff, he walks into the king's presence in his palace to serve him his usual. And the next thing you know, the king brother Benefield notices that Nehemiah's countenance is very sad. Nehemiah is walking around with a long face. You know why? He's under a heavy burden. You, when you see somebody that's a child of God and they don't got a great smile on their face and they look like they're under distress, don't always count that as they don't got the victory. Sometimes they're, they're wearing a, and they're carrying a burden that nobody else knows anything about. But Nehemiah walked into the king's palace to serve him as usual. And as he gets there and the king realizes that he's got a sad countenance, he wants to know, Nehemiah, what is wrong with you? Nehemiah begins to tell him the reason why he is upset. He says to the king, King, my people are still in captivity and this place over here in Jerusalem, it has been destroyed. It's in ruins. That is the sepulchers of our forefathers, our people. Man, let me tell you, if you found out that the cemetery where your grandfather and great grandfathers and great great grandparents was buried in was a place of ruin. Don't tell me if you got any heart at all you wouldn't want to go and fix that place up. Amen. 
I've got a grandfather that's buried in a place not too far from here. When our family grew up, white rice, stewed tomatoes, amen, fish sticks, and a little leftover fried chicken and stuff like that. Stretch out, eat eggs for supper, eat rice just about every night, buy giant packs of hamburger meat and make everything out of you can imagine. We grew up poor. We didn't have a lot. My grandfather worked for Lake Region Packing and he used to work a lot of long hours driving a semi truck. We didn't have a lot. They didn't have a lot. But I can tell you this. Amen. When my grandfather died, he didn't die a wealthy man. He didn't have a lot of great possessions as the world may think. And he didn't have a whole lot of money. Amen. To be able to take care of his own funeral arrangements. And I can tell you when I went down to his little place of burial, I looked down there, Brother Jeremy, and there was a tattered place where they dug the ground up and they stuck a little tin thing right in the dirt. Anybody seen one like that? It's just enough little white piece of paper that in a few years or months uh, that the words would just fade off. Nobody would even know who was there. You know what I thought to myself? I ain't got a lot of money and I don't have a lot of means, uh, but I'm going to do something about it. I went down to Home Depot. I got me some little things to stick around the outside and fixed it up. I came, put a little seat right there at the end of his grave and I sat right there and wept my eyes out. As I said, Grandpa, all the years of things uh, that you did for me, the things you taught me, the times we went fishing, uh, this is the least that I can do for you. Do you know the people in that city, they fought hard, they worked hard, and now that city's laying ruined. Is it all right if I preach this out like this? I just feel like preaching. It might be the longest sermon system ours. Here is a city where some of them probably grew up. Their forefathers. Stories told around old campfires. The crossing the Red Sea. The victory of God. How that God created them and how they were the apple of God's eye. Now that place is laid waste. One man says, I can't tolerate to look at it. I can't tolerate to think about it. I got to do something about this. Can I bring that in perspective for everyday church? It bothers the daylights out of me. When I look back and I know churches that I used to attend, I preached in them, and they've gave up the fight. Some of them are closing down the doors. Many of them just walked away like it didn't mean anything at all. And many of our churches through compromise and everything are lying waste. When I walk into a church, it's all about all this and nothing about the preaching of the true word of God. It's a hop and a bunny hop and a skip and a jump and everything. You know what? It bothers me because I look at some of them churches and I think to myself, I remember people getting the Holy Ghost up there. I remember watching people get, amen, get the power of the Holy Ghost in a choir saw. Amen. Go to sling in their hair, take off running around the church in the victory of God fall, watching young people getting filled with the Holy Ghost slain in the spirit, gifts of the spirit and operation healing in the church. And now you walk in and everything's about singing. Everything's about entertainment. Everything's about bless me, tickle me, pat me, rub me with a little oil and make me feel good in my sin kind of junk. And I don't know about you, but there's a Nehemiah inside of me rising up that says I'm sick to my guts with this modern day stuff. God, give me the old time religion. It's good enough for me. If it was good enough for our forefathers, it's good enough for me. It's time that the church rises up and begins to build once again. And you say, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Nehemiah begins to recite his reasoning to the king as to why that he wants this city to be rebuilt. The king says, how long? He wanted to make sure he wasn't up to some kind of no good. He said, just give me the time that I need to rebuild this city. While you're at it, king, since you've got the power and the authority, talk to that old fellow over there that has the ability to provide me with the wood and the materials 
to build the city. What I want you to see is how God is using one man to allow pieces of this puzzle one by one to fall into place. Huh? God knew how he could make it happen. Maybe in their day there were people that didn't have the means. Y'all listening? Sometimes we crawl up in a little ball. Spirits say, oh God, we're poor little orphans. We, we, oh God, what are we going to do? Ain't nobody got that much money. Ain't nobody got that much vision. Ain't nobody. Let me tell you, if God has to use somebody on the outside, amen, somebody that just got saved, God will use whatever means he has to to accomplish his goal. If he's got to move on the heart of King Artaxerxes, if he's got to move on the heart of a man that has the material, God can do it. Boy, I got so much to preach, but I got to move on. So the man of God is talking to this king. King's giving him the approval. King says, go on, go do it. So the man of God mounts up. And he heads out. When he gets where he's going, Jerusalem. The Bible says he's there three days. I'll have to look again. I think it said three nights, but I know it's at least three days. When I read this, Never before had it hit me. You know I like typologies and I like foreshadows in the word of God of the things that come in the New Testament. But it hit me. The same way that Nehemiah was a master rebuilder of the things that were broken and torn. A leader that would lead a great people to do great things. Three days, you hear me? Three days passed before that he rallied the troops and got them all together. My God, I'm telling you, when I read that, I thought about how the Lord said in three days, I come on now, in three days, I'll tear down this place and I'll build it up again. And the people thought he was talking about the earthly, amen, things. But the Lord was talking about the spiritual. And you know how long he died and how long that he remained in the grave? How many remembers how long it was? But thank God when he came up out of that grave, he came up, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. I'm telling us here this morning, because he lives, because he's able, you and I are able this morning. My God, I feel him this morning. Give him praise. Woo! So the man of God goes out three days, three nights. According to what I read, Sister Mel, I don't read anything that would lead me to believe anything other. And as a matter of fact, it even alludes to this. Nobody that was with him really knew what was going on in his mind. Nobody really knew what he was there to do. I mean, what? They might have thought we're just over there to take a vacation and look at the ruins. I don't know. But he got up in the middle of the night. I don't know, maybe donkey, horse, I don't know. But he went out, saddled up in the blackness of night. See that in your mind. He's riding by horseback possibly throughout the ruins. Passes over old broken down places. He comes to one place. He said, I couldn't even pass over the rubble and the junk because the animal underneath me could not pass over it. You're here this morning and there's so much ruin and rubble and junk you just can't pass over it. But God has already placed it in your heart and motivated you to do something about it. Come on now. I'll just use this as an example. But I told you here the other day, we got a neighbor in our backyard behind us. They got this gigantic, looks like a maple leaf tree, whatever. Man, you're talking about some big old leaves and they are so annoying. It fills my whole entire backyard. Looks like a sea of leaves. We got out there and we got them big contractor size garbage bags and we filled about eight bags slab full. The boys were complaining the whole time about how bad it was. We had so much dust and dirt in our face.
face and neck and eyes and everything. But you know what we had to do? One handful, one scoop, one swipe at a time. Fill that bag, fill that bag, fill that bag. Let me tell you, your life might not get better overnight. But one scoop, one swipe, one, come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. One little thing at a time, God can put it back together. One little, come on somebody, one prayer time, one altar service, one revival night, one camp meeting service. I feel like I could just about blast off this morning. I feel the presence of God. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you this morning that all it takes is somebody that'll get motivated to do something. Let me share something with you. There are some of you that can testify to this, and you know what I'm talking about. Sister Benefield shared with me some things about her own mother. And I've shared this in the past for sake of example. I remember when we first met Sister Christina. We started serving God. She was serving God, I think, for we really was sold out. And she used to hang out with us all the time. But there was one thing that I knew about Christina of the many things that I got to know about her. She had a keychain with a little thing on the keychain. And whose picture was on that keychain? Your great-grandma. And I asked her one time, who is that? She said, that's my great grandma. And I said, why you got a picture of her, specifically of her? And she began to tell me how that she had been such a spiritual uh, inspiration to so many people because she lived a good, solid life before God. There are a lot of people here, Sister Benefield, like your mother, and some of you that you had one Nehemiah in your family. <laughs> Woo! You had one Nehemiah that loved God. That it wasn't that they never had storms. It wasn't that they never had times they could barely pay their bills. It wasn't that they never laid hands on somebody and they didn't get and they got didn't get healed. It wasn't that they didn't have problems. Uh, but they was a persistent, dedicated, faithful Nehemiah. I had a phone call from Sister Benefield here a while back, and she began to tell me about some things in her family. I'm not going to go into it because that's her business but she began to tell me about problems of this and that and wanted me to pray and I told Sister Benefield I said Sister Benefield there's some things uh, I can't control you can't control I can't make my kids uh, I can't make my church I can't make my friends do stuff I said but if you'll keep living the life I said whether in this life while you see it or later down the road I said you keep planting seeds uh, and you keep leaving a legacy my God that somebody knows what God Here's and who he is. I've heard of prayer stories where great mamas, those old saints, them old Nehemiah spirited people, huh? That prayed prayers for their babies. And they died never seeing them come to the Lord. But those seeds of prayer were still in the soil of their heart. And sometimes after mama had already gone on to be with the Lord, her baby got saved. And her baby experienced the benefits of mama's prayer. I want to ask you this morning, have we got any one Nehemiah in this day one Nehemiah that says I'll be that motivated mama preacher I got family and friends that won't serve God but I'll be that motivated mama I'll take a hold of the plow if nobody else won't you've heard me sing this little chorus and I love it though none go with me Still, I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. I thank God that I've got a spouse, that we serve God together. But we've had this conversation more than once. I love you, and you love me. But if you don't serve God, that's on you. Because I'm not letting you keep me from serving God. Come on now. What about your children? So because your spouse don't want to serve God, you say, well, forget it. Your children are sitting right there watching your life. 
Huh? I had a lady get saved right here at Gray Street some years ago. Wept and cried before my wife and I in my church office. And this was her testimony. She said, preacher, I thank God that I got saved at this age. She said, but I've already raised my children. They're grown now. Starting to step out on their own. And she wept as she said, they've watched me do foolish, sinful, ungodly things all of their life. She put her face in her hands and she wept and shook and she said, I can't do anything about yesterday and I don't want them to follow in my footsteps. I don't want to see them experience the pain and the suffering that I went through. When she looked up at us, I said, Sister, let me tell you something. I said, You can't do a thing about your mess and past. That is behind you. I said, Today is a brand new day. Put your best foot forward, stay in the altar, serve God. And I said, every day you live, I said, you'll be building a brand new testimony. And when they ask you about your old self, you can tell them, I'm not her anymore. I'm not him anymore. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I've shared this before, but one of my favorite testimonies, and I heard one preacher that I knew, amen, he was preaching about how that in his past life, he was a bad alcoholic, and he would go to these AA meetings and so forth, and they'd make you stand up, and they'd make you say, recite this uh, alcoholic's prayer, or whatever statement, basically to say, in other words, I've always been an alcoholic and I'm a recovering alcoholic in so many words, but I'll always be an alcoholic. And uh, the way that he explained it, he said that, he said, I- I've thought many times about those little meetings where people would sit around and cry and everybody felt like they had no hope because there was a pretty good chance they were just going to relapse. He told how many years that he had been clean and clear from the alcohol. And he said, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. He said, I'd like to go back to one of those meetings. And I'd like to sit there. And whenever they ask me to introduce myself, I'd like to stand up and say, Hello, my name's Curtis Teague. And I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you something. What greater testimony is there than that? Come on, somebody. Instead of some long-faced person that's still struggling. Hello, my name is Joe Myers. I was free for three weeks, but I'll probably relapse again. Come on now. I don't want to have that kind of testimony. God is a sure deliverer, and he's able to do things you that'll blow your mind. How do you know? Because I've seen him do it. Over and over, over the years. I want to tell you something this morning. This same Nehemiah, he not only gets motivated to go and talk to the people. I want you to listen to the motivational speech of a man of God who feels moved to do something. In Nehemiah 2 and 17 and 18. Now listen closely. This is what he said. This is after... All the pieces begin to come together. I want you to think about that before I preach it. All the pieces, God had laid them all out. There was just one more thing that had to happen before the city got rebuilt. What was it? Nehemiah had to get the strength and the help of the rest of the crowd. I want to tell you something, folks. I don't care if God anointed me to be a great preacher or semi-good. I can't make this church do nothing that the rest of the crowd don't want to rise up and do. Listen. Verse number 17 and 18. Then said I unto them, 
You see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste. And the gates that are of burned with fire come. Let us build up the wall of Jerusalem. There would be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. You know what the people did? They looked back at that motivational speaker, (laughs) and they said, Sister Wilma, let us rise up and build. And the Bible said so they strengthened their hands for this good work. It wasn't enough to just say, y'all listening? Let us rise up and build. The Bible said they did something. They strengthened their hands. They fortified their armory. They made sure, Sister Debbie, they had the means and the power to carry out what they said. We got more than our eyeballs could see of people in our churches that say one thing and don't deliver. Well, let's have revival and then don't nobody show up. Let's see people filled with the Holy Ghost and you're more worried about getting to McDonald's before they close than praying with somebody to receive the Holy Ghost. Am I still preaching? Huh? You're more worried about getting somebody's phone number or text message or asking them what they saw on Facebook or what happened or blah, blah, blah. You get your head out of the sand and you realize there's a work to be done. And if one person, amen, one motivational person can set a spark, it can set the whole place on fire. Come on, somebody. I've seen it happen over the years where that just one person in a family get a hold of God, go back home, and wind up getting the whole family saved. Come on, somebody. The day that Brother Billy and his family walked into the church, when the night they went to leave, he said, there's a lot of us. He said, there's more than this. He said, I'd like to see the rest of them get in church. I said, well, let's still work on getting every one of them saved, every one of them serving God. You can't make nobody do anything. But let me tell you something, folks. Uh, The greatest way to live is this right here. You might say, oh, it's playing on this PlayStation, preacher. It's watching a Super Bowl, preacher. It's owning a big house and a bunch of we can barely make. That's the way we live. I'll tell you, life is serving God. How do I know I am living it? Are oh, you just saying that because you're a preacher? No, I was once where some of you are. I'm not saying I've arrived. I'm just telling you, I gave my life to God and He turned me in another direction. He changed my desires. He changed my wants. He changed my way of looking at things. He changed the way I felt about people. And I thought to myself, that was not even possible. I told the church here the other night, I said, what I could say is that God gave my wife a brand new husband. Sister Amanda Creech, Cannon, what have you. She, I don't know what she, her name is. I guess it's one of the two. She testified at one point. She said, I remember coming home from uh, church and going to stay the night at y'all's house and you in a pair of shorts and a tank top t-shirt standing in the living room bebopping and singing John Michael Montgomery's uh, uh, auction song. <laughs> and uh, she said, I'm thankful to see what God's doing in you. I said, me too, sis. Amen. I tell you this morning that God's able to do some big, big things. He can take you from where you are, amen, and help you rise up. Amen. I want you to tell you this morning, some of you, every time I turn around, somebody's on a diet. I won't look nowhere. But the majority of weight loss success stories started with someone that got tired of the way things were. Tired of hearing the doctor say, your cholesterol is five times what it should be. You're going to die in three months if you don't change your eating habits. You know, that kind of thing. Somebody that got tired of the way things were and that said, you know what? I'm ready to do something about it. Most all success stories start with somebody that's tired of the way things are. I'll tell you the reason why a lot of churches ain't having church because they're comfortable with a few old songs, a little bit of preaching, a five, about five minutes or less of praying if they go to the altar and go home. 
still live in the mess all week long. Amen. I can't help but wonder this morning. So get ready to close. What would have happened if one Nehemiah wouldn't have been so stirred in his heart to inspire the people to rise up and build? Do you know what the equivalent to that would be? I want you all to listen to me because I'm closing, bringing all this to a head. What would it have been like, Brother David, if one Nehemiah hadn't stirred the heart of the people in verse 17 and 18 and said, hey, let's do this. That's the equivalent in our day of the jail ministries that would have never been established across America and worldwide. The retirement homes that were never reached or evangelized. The homeless people that were never reached. The communities that were never inspired. Loved ones that never got saved. Had someone not got motivated and turned and motivated the crowd. You may not think it this morning, but there's a lot of people that are possibly counting on you to do the right thing. These people went from bondage to building. They went from bondage to building. All they had to do was want it. Had somebody not wanted it, they'd still be over there in captivity somewhere during this time. But somebody said, we want this, and God said, you want it? Is that what you want? I'll move on the heart of the king. I'll move on the heart of the God. It's got the material, and I'll make sure that it can happen if that's what you really want. I believe God's speaking to you this morning and really trying to stir your heart whether you really want this or not. While you sit in the valley of decision, you're trying to make up your mind whether you want it or not. Well, you know, if I do this, and i got to change that, and if I don't change that, then this is going to happen. And then... I, I just, I, preacher, I really don't see how this is possible. I mean, I'd really like to serve God, and all this sounds good on paper, but, but when I leave here, you know, I've got to face him and her and them, and I just don't see how this is going to work. If you'll just take one small little step, it will blow your mind what the power of choice can do. How important is choice? It's this important. That's the one thing God will not override. If you don't want to serve Him, He ain't going to make you. He's not going to force you. He's not going to push you, pull you, or drag you. But the Bible said, He'll lead you. He'll lead you. But you've got to make up your mind that that is what you want. And all you have to do is make a step and be sincere to follow through. You can't be like that crowd that says, Yes, preacher, let's rise up and build. Man, that sounds wonderful. And never do a thing about it. Never strengthen yourself in the Lord. Stand all across this house this morning, if you will. These people went from bondage to building. And I'm going to tell you the reason why more people don't build in this day. Three of the things that the Holy Ghost had impressed on my heart that are probably three of the biggest ones. Fear. What could happen, what might happen, what might not happen. Doubt. Sometimes your low self-esteem and you think, you look inwardly at yourself and you think, well, I failed, I failed at so many other things in life, I probably can't succeed at this either. Let me tell you the difference. Like the old songwriter said, I have somebody with me to share my heavy load and I feel His presence near me. Every day, 
Though trouble overtakes me along life's weary road, I have somebody with me all the way. You're not going to be doing it by yourself. And isn't it just like the devil? Just when you start feeling motivated to try to do something with your life, to do what the devil did in verse number 19. They said, When Sanballat the Horonite, the Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn, despised us, and said, What is this thing that you'll do? You're going to rebel against the king? This is how the devil is. Sister Tracy, can you hand the baby to Sister Myers to come help me with the piano, please, this morning? It would be a great appreciation. In closing this morning, won't you listen to me? God's brought you to a great intersection in your life this morning. What you do with it's up to you. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you going to let the devil keep you and your household in bondage, in your heritage, in waste? Are you going to do something about it? You're just going to let everything fall apart in front of you? Everything God ever intended to do in your life because of choices and things that you decided to do because you wanted to do your thing, your life is headed in the wrong direction. Come here, Justin, for just a minute, son. I'm trying not to embarrass you. Come here, buddy. Just come walking this way. Now stop right there. There's a lot of folks that are kind of walking in one direction. But if they're willing to make one decision, God can get them turned around, going the right way. That's where some of you may be, some of your family. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. I'm going to ask you to come right now. You say, preacher, are you serious? Yes, right now. Don't let your ego, don't let your, your spirit and mind or attitude or flesh or people or what someone thinks keep you out of this altar. You felt that stirring in your heart this morning. You cannot deny that. Conviction has been here. Saints of God, if you're saved, I want you to bow your heads with me and I want you to begin to pray right now fervently. Come on, if you claim to have the Holy Ghost, I need your prayers this morning. I want you to begin to pray right now. God, turn things around. There are people this morning that need God's help. And the only way they're going to get it is if they just make a choice. Run to the altar, turn to God, and trust the Lord for His help. This could be a monumental service to turn your entire life around. And it's all 